Welcome back to the Mom Mentality Show. My name is Austin Chadwick and co-host is Chris Lucian. And today we're definitely excited to have James Shore join us. We got a handful of great topics that uh, we got on the Kanban board, including uh, uh, a mob programming chapter in James's book, uh, Scaling with Fast, Evolutionary Design, and Testing Without Mocks. So we'll see what we get to. It should be a, a fun ride. Uh, but before jumping to those topics, James, can you give us a little introduction about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm James Shore. I have been, I'm an old XP or extreme programming person. I got involved with it back in 2000. Loved it. Uh, loved it so much that I wasn't willing to do anything else, but nobody else was doing anything remotely related to extreme programming in 2000. So I had to become a consultant to teach people how to do it, to, to spread, the, spread the good word. Boy, I sound like an evangelist. I am a little bit of an evangelist. Uh, and eventually I ended up writing, uh, writing a book called The Art of Agile Development, which uh, has recently come out in a second edition. And um, I believe has the chapter on mob programming we're going to be talking about. So uh, that is me. The, today I still go around and teach people how to do uh, extreme programming and extreme programming related things. Um, mostly through immersion coaching when possible. So like the best way to learn is to really just get in there and do it for real rather than sitting through a one or two day course. We love that. And uh, we will second that for sure. And uh, yeah, so I think uh, it was, I can't remember exactly when it was, but I remember you put out a tweet and you were saying like, hey, in the second version of my book, I'm going to do uh, a, ch a chapter on mob programming. Uh, yeah. So tell us about that journey a little bit and uh, what your, uh, what your book uh, jumps into. Well, this, the second edition of the book, um, first edition came out in 2007, late 2007. And mm. this edition came out just, well, it's April, 2022. Now it came out about four months ago, five mm. months ago. And um, that's, what is that? 14 years. So I've learned a lot since then. And the, the agile community has changed a lot since then. And the book has always been, here's how you do it for real. So one of the things that's happened in the last 14 years is, of course, uh, invention of mob programming um, by Woody Zool, Chris Lucian, and the other fine people at uh, Hunter Industries. So um, I wanted to include that because it's got a, it's got a lot of traction. And um, one of the things that's really interesting about mobbing, as opposed to pairing in a team room, and with you know with good teamwork skills is that mobbing makes a lot of all those skills you need in sort of the classic XP style of, of collective ownership, um, makes a lot of that easier. It makes a lot of the challenges go away, although it does bring you know some, some of its own. Um, and I thought that was, I, I, th I thought that was worth mentioning and, and wanted to make sure that there was a decent amount of material about how to do that well. Nice, nice. Yeah. And so what was your goal to basically just introduce the topic for someone who doesn't know about it or to give your take on it? Uh, what, what should a reader look forward to in that chapter? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, everything in the book is this is how you do it for real. So okay. if you're interested in mobbing um, or ensemble programming, as some people like to call it, uh, then the, the book will help you figure out how to get started. And it will provide you with references for further reading and experiments to try to develop your skills further. But um, everything in the book is if you've never done this before, or even if you have done this before, but aren't getting the results you want, here's a way that will work and um, what to try next after, uh, after you're comfortable with that way. Hold on. Cool. So, uh, yeah, so I think, uh, well, that, that's good. It was a good little side note to uh, nod to the book there. And I'm um, looking forward to digging into that myself. Uh, but it's maybe a good time to transition to uh, the next topic, which is scaling with fast. So, uh, yeah, I've noticed uh, conference talks and, uh, yeah, a whole host of things I've seen around this topic. Uh, what's your passion here lately? Uh, I So I've been, excuse me. <clears throat> I have been uh, involved with scaling organizations for several years, several years now, five, six, maybe seven years. I've been, people have been hiring me. They've got larger organizations, well, larger than just one team. How do we work with multiple teams on a single product? And what I've been doing is what these days people are gonna call team topologies. Uh, after the book by Matthew Skelton and Manuel P. 
Pays. I don't know if I'm pronouncing their names right. Uh, it's a good book. It's a, it describes something I call horizontal scaling. And uh, the, the essence of horizontal scaling is that we're going to make sure that each team can work autonomously and independently. And uh, we're going to have very clear definitions of how the relationships between teams so that we can minimize the sort of miscommunication that happens when two, communi when two teams try to work together. Uh, and I've been doing this for quite a while, and it, it has a lot of benefits, but it also doesn't work very well long term because of Conway's law, which says that you need the structure of the organ. Well, Conway's law says that the structure of the code will match the structure of the organization. But there's also something called the reverse Conway's maneuver, reverse Conway maneuver, where if you want to have a particular structure of code, design your organization to reflect that structure. But the problem is, is that over years, um, I worked with one organization, um, uh, they had 300 people in their uh, software development department, uh, 42 teams. And we did this whole exercise of, of designing a really good horizontally scaled system. And it worked well for them for a couple of years. And we even designed an architectural group that's whose entire big part of their job was to Think about Conway's law and continue to manage the structure. Hmm. But what happened was that as business needs changed, the structure of the organization didn't keep up. And I've seen that happen again and again. Um, and this is even more pronounced in organizations that change a lot um, or have maybe uh, more exploration to do about what, what they want from their business and their products. So um, I started looking for another way. And what I found was FAST, that's Fluid Scaling Technology. It's by Ron Cortell. You can find it at fastagile.io. And um, FAST is what I'd call a vertical scaling uh, approach, uh, where horizontal scaling is you increase the number of people you have working on a product by creating more teams. FAST is a way of increasing the number of people you have working on the product by having more people work as a single team. Um, and FAST is not really just one big team, but you have a bunch of people who act as a single team. And uh, so I had a chance to try it last year and it worked really well. And so now I'm telling everybody I can about it because I think this is actually a superior approach to the horizontal scaling uh, technique. And I have no horse in this race. Like the, I get no royalties <laughs> for this. I just think it's better. Yeah, it's almost to say like the the ultimate uh, inverse Conway maneuver is, you know, if you want your code to be easily refactored, then your team re refactored, your, your team needs to be easily refactored. That's right. Right. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I, I think, uh, I think just fr from the outside, looking at the way um, uh, fast is and speaking to Ron about it, I think that uh, it's, it's definitely an interesting approach. Um, what would you say like some of the key features of fast are that allow for this sort of flexibility? Well, I think the, the number one feature of fast is also the thing that makes it, it's, it's sort of like extreme programming in a lot of ways. And I think it will probably have, uh, the same sort of impact that extreme programming did once it gets out there and that there'll be a core body of people who will really get into it and they'll have a lot of success. And hopefully that will engage a lot of interest, but most likely it will be watered down into something that's unrecognizable, just like extreme programming was. But for those of you who want to pick it up, it's got a lot of potential. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to answer your question, Chris, but I want to mention one other thing that I think is really compelling about FAST, which is that whenever I look at organizations scaling, they always have some discipline, some skill sets that they don't have enough of to have put on every team and it doesn't make sense to put on every, on every team. Um, you usually user experience design, security, ops. Um, those are, you know, tend to be three things, particularly user experience design that are sort of understaffed to the, relative to the number of teams you have. Um, but in fast, because you've got so many people working together, these people can move around to where they're needed. You don't need to have one for every team or two for every team, but you could have three working together on, on one subset of the team if they needed so um, what makes FAST really unique is that you do have people breaking up into teams, but they do it on a very, very short cadence. Uh, by default, it's every two days. And uh, Ron said that his group tried uh, a week and they decided to go back to two days. And that was my experience too with the group I did, which was entirely remote. Um, 
they start out with two days just to sort of do it by the book, tried it a week, went back to two days because because uh, it just worked better. But every two days, team has a, a meeting called the fast meeting where they decide what they're going to work on, sort of like a stand-up, and then people volunteer to work on teams. And it takes about 15, 20 minutes. It's just Badoom, badoom. Uh, Self-organized into teams. Then we go off and we work as normal. Um, by the book, Ron's approach, they used mob programming. Um, group I, the, the folks I worked with were not comfortable with that. They weren't even comfortable with pairing. Um, I think they have some work to do in terms of learning how to work together well as teams. Um, so they worked mostly individually. And what was neat is that worked just as well. Uh, I would say this was actually kind of a torture test for fast because we have a group of folks who were not really familiar with agile, um, not, uh, not really people who like to work together, very individualistic and, um, all working remote and it still worked really well. Fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. That's a really interesting test case. Cause, uh, I remember hearing Ron's story and it did, it did sound like a group who is more interested in exploring uh, collaborative techniques and trying agile things, you know, and so that that's a real interesting test case. And I will have to attest that uh, that is a really, uh, you know, the, I, I, I've heard of some of the mechanics of fast and some of how it works, but the idea that it's one team, that is really cool concept to think of because um, basically it's the whole group is changing all the time. And uh, one thing that we noticed that we, uh, have a lot in common with fast is the ability what you're talking about like security you know uh, ui ux or database can sometimes be this way or uh, more infrastructure and pipeline is that um, while we don't follow the fast mechanics exactly like in that same kind of way we do notice that those kind of people tend to float around the mobs or teams uh, more often because in our environment people have freedom to move uh, similar to fast and uh yeah, yeah. So how did, um, yeah, what were some of the patterns you've seen with the cross-discipline? Um, so you mentioned at one point they were all on one team because they like specialized on one thing and then they kind of spread out. The, did, it, did it have any trends or flows with the specialists flowing throughout all the mini teams? <laughs> well, the group I worked with didn't have a user experience folks. So that was more of an example. Um, what, what they have is, so it's actually a business intelligence group. So they're doing data engineering more mm -hmm. than normal software engineering. Uh, so it's another way that's sort of a stress test for this, for this idea that, um, uh, and another one was uh, Ron had a whole bunch of XP coaches, which I would really highly recommend um, just for anybody, but uh, these folks didn't have that level of coaching. Um, and it's still, the fast structure still worked. They have experienced some problems as a result of not having that coaching and also having the in very highly individualistic folks, but the fast structure itself still really worked well. Um, what we did have, though, is um, uh, they had not user experience designers because this is business intelligence. They had some data engineers and then they had, um, I don't remember what the term was for it, but basically the people who would design the reports and so forth that use the data. And yeah, they would just mix and match as needed. Um, it, it's, it's called fluid scaling technology, and it really is very fluid. Um, you get up every couple of days, say, you know, this is how we're going to move us towards, I want to lead a team solving this part of the problem that we've got. And people just join that team according to uh, the skills they have. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. One thing that uh, we've, you know, I've had conversations with people about uh, this style way of working uh, before. And one thing that tends to come up a lot is people who, you know, they like switching teams, but it's more on like a yearly cadence as opposed to every two day cadence. And this whole thing sounds very scary and chaotic to them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is there anything you uh, have on like kind of coaching uh, the chaos or the fear of chaos? <laughs> yeah. I mean, my experience was that the, um, there was definitely some fear about that. You know, that company that had 300 uh, 300 folks in the software organization, probably 200 engineers. Um, we did self-organization for that group as well, the horizontal teams. Um, and there was a lot of fear from that group, uh, a lot more fear about the self-organization than I saw from the organization that did fast. And I think that's because at that horizontally scaled company, it was, I mean, theoretically, there was going to be a mechanism to move between teams, but it, there was, it was a big commitment. 
Um, whereas in the fast team, once they, once they sort of wrap their head around the idea, which, which took a while, we did about six months of change management before we really started, uh, uh, pushing the button and making it go. Um, the, uh, once they wrap their head around it, it was, it was a lot less scary. They didn't mind, but what was challenging for people was a couple of things. First off, they were heavily project managed. Um, they had two people with a title PO or PM, or one person with a title of PO or PM for every two engineers. Um, and these folks were more like project managers than product, uh, product folks. Um, and so they were very, you know, emphasis, heavy emphasis on deadlines and what are you going to get done and when. And um, I would say that the PO, PMs in that group still are struggling with the idea of a collaborative work environment rather than these are my engineers that I'm telling what to do, um, which is unfortunately a problem I see a lot of in putatively so-called agile organizations. Um, and so one of the struggles that people had was even though we made it really clear and we did a lot of change management that the two-day fast meeting was just a check-in. It was more like a stand-up and a check-in than a sprint iteration boundary engineers were putting a lot of pressure on themselves to get stuff done every two days. And that was really hard. Mm. And the other thing that people struggled with, um, and I don't know, I think they may, I'm still in touch with this organization, but I'm not doing the active coaching for them anymore. But um, I am working with their, their sort of internal coaches once weekly. Um, I think they may still be having some issues where people feel like because they can switch teams, they are supposed to switch teams, but that's not of course the case. Uh, the expectation is that people will find a place and stay there until they're no longer needed there and then, then move on. And that was, that was Ron's experience on with his fast uh, experiment. And that was certainly my experience as well, but it's, it's caused some anxiety for folks. Um, so in this group, definitely some anxiety around, um, do, I, do I have to get everything done? Um, do I have to move teams or is my ground stable? And also I have to work with other people. Um, so I wouldn't say it's something that you can just put into place and have everything magically work. You definitely need some coaching. Um, I think this group could have used some more coaches okay. like to, to be part of the teams. Mm -hmm. But um, again, the fast part of it has worked really well and that that i would do again um but i would do more to to help these really really individualistic people learn how to work together if i were to do uh, that organization again the um so for the last five years we we've had a model uh as we scaled out our department we kind of went from five to 30 and in that model we we um we used budgetary constraints basically saying like this product can only have this many resources so, so there was limitations around that um and uh and so it's like not like everybody could work on the least valuable <laughs> product maybe um and then uh you know i think what I, another thing that we found you know um because i we did we did see um yeah, I guess it was it was too loose. It was more loose than fast in the sense that uh, we're not saying, hey, there is a cadence at which we reevaluate where we are. And so, um, you know, there were people that moved around, but then there were also those who wanted to stay on the same team for many years. Uh, and I think we've kind of identified that as an anti pattern um, mm. as well. And, and uh, at one point put in a limitation that, uh, no one is able to stay on a team for longer than two years. And so now people can change whenever they want, but uh, must move before a certain point. Um, but I think just uh, explicit attention to how long somebody stays on the team and, and what's healthy around that, I think is um, a really great addition um, to, to this sort of thing. It's just you know, we retrospect on all sorts of things. And I think that this at least has a built-in retrospective around uh, maybe tenure on a task or a, mm -hmm. a, a team or something like that. So pretty cool stuff. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I think a lot of fast resonates. I also like the, this idea that um, it's open space and open allocation and like, you know, open spaces I think are well-known. And so you can kind of say, hey, 
you know, take your whole backlog and make it an open space. And now you kind of have, uh, you know, fast. I think it's a, a pretty um, solid analogy as well. So, um, but maybe it's a good time to move on to evolutionary design um, and, and talk a little bit about that. So uh, what are you thinking in, in that vein? Well, this has got nothing to do with fast. I just, uh, you asked me, when you asked me what topics we talk about it, I, I picked some of my favorite topics, um, which are all not necessarily related to each other. Um, evolutionary design, I think, is the most important idea in Agile that nobody uses. The, uh, the, it comes from Kent Beck. Um, I break it down into three parts. It's incremental design, reflective design, and continuous design. Um, and it's basically this idea, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> it's basically this idea that we are going to be constantly revising and improving our design as we go. We're going to start out with the simplest design that we can think of um, and only solve the problems in front of us today and then revise our code uh, continuously forward. And Kent Beck, I don't know if I've, I've got the quote, but um, exactly right. But Kent Beck in the first edition of Extreme Programming Explained said that uh, the cost of change curve is one of the driving ideas behind extreme programming. And the cost of change curve is basically that things get more expensive to change over time. And I think we've all had that experience. But if that is true, if it, the cheapest time to build something is at the beginning of the project, and the longer you wait to make a decision to build something, the more expensive it gets, Agile is a terrible idea. Because that means you need to make all your decisions up front and build them all up front. Um, and plan for it all up front and you know, have it sort of locked in place. Agile and extreme programming only work if the cost of change is either flat or declining over time. And uh, that's why this is the most important idea that nobody uses because evolutionary design is the, is the technique for decreasing the cost of change over time rather than allowing it to increase. So if you're not continuous, if you're not starting with the simplest possible thing and not in continually improving your design as you go, your costs are increasing and you should not be making decisions late. Yeah. So this is something I'm, I'm very passionate about, obviously. And, uh, you know, I, I think uh, I had a recent experience that even maybe a little bit of a different thing where I was talking to a team and, uh, and, you know, they have a big change to make to an application and, they basically said, uh, you know, here's our architecture now and here's where it's going to be. And then, and then I was like, well, yeah, but so where are the architecture revisions in between, like when you're thinking about this? And, and so, you know, I told them what you're showing me right now is like the meme where it's like how to draw an owl. It's like first a circle and then an oval. And then you, sh you draw the outline. Right? Right, right. <laughs> and, uh, and so um, now I think internally we, we refer to, uh, to small design revisions as owls. It's like, how, how many owls, you know, what, what owls will it take to, to move there? Um, and it, it's kind of been uh, kind of a, a, an interesting thing, but like, you know, any, I think, large conceptual change, um, you know, talking about it saying what are the what are evolutions that we can take to move us closer to that um is is a great uh a great headspace to put people in and i think that that the that owl meme was was kind of perfect for that um so uh maybe i get you know you, you mentioned the book but are there any resources or any, any um advice or tips that you'd give to people that are facing uh um large upfront design versus evolutionary design um how how can they think differently what would you say there uh, so the the key idea i think in in evolutionary design is that you start uh, at any given moment you want the design of your system to be perfect for the problems that you're solving today and with without respect for the problems that you think you might have to solve tomorrow or next week or next month um, and this makes people really nervous. They're like, well, but I have to solve this. You know, there, this, there's this thing coming up that if I don't solve this, it's going to be a big problem. And it's true that there are some things that are really expensive to change later. Choice of programming language is one of them. Choice of underlying framework is typically very hard to change, which is actually why I don't prefer not to use frameworks because libraries are pretty easy to change. Um, 
And so from an architectural perspective, part of your job, if you're using evolutionary design is to think to yourself, what is gonna be difficult to change later? And how can I make those things not a part of my design? Um, if I'm using a library and I think it's gonna be difficult to change later because it's gonna have sort of had its tendrils throughout the entire application, maybe I'm gonna wrap that library up in an adapter so that the adapter doesn't change and the underlying library does. Um, or maybe I say, well, I'm gonna use, oh, let's say uh, I'm gonna use Ruby on Rails and that means I'm stuck with Ruby on Rails forever. And that is a decision that I'm making. Um, but that's a, that's a conscious choice to be made. But outside of those sort of big architectural decisions, um, although you do need to pay attention to what is the things that's being costly to, to change, the whole idea is reduce your cost of change. So start out, only build what you need for today. Don't worry about tomorrow, um, as long as you're keeping your cost of change low. And then when you need that thing, or if you need that thing, then build in that design. So to give an example, um, I, when I did, I did a, let's a JavaScript screencast called let's code JavaScript way back in 2012. And, uh, to do this, I wrote the whole website in node, partly so that I had enough competence in JavaScript to actually do the screencast about test-driven JavaScript. Um, and when I built this, the very first thing I did was I needed a, I needed the site to render a web page. So all I did was I wrote just enough node.js code to render a web page. And that was it. And then I wrote just enough node.js code to render a web page and images. And then I wrote just enough to render a web page and images and a template uh, instead of a, a static page. And I just continued on this round. And, and at every step, I found some duplication because now the code that does the images and the code that does the static HTML, there's a lot of commonalities there. So I factor that out. Code that does the templates, it's, it's doing something kind of interesting. So I'm gonna factor that out and, and so on. Um, so it's build a little code, refactor, build a little code, refactor, constantly thinking what's gonna be difficult to change how can I factor that so it's behind a single interface so I can change it in one place? Um, and that went on for 10 years. And I, that code base is now running all of my websites, my Let's Code JavaScript site, which is still available, my jamesshore.com website. Uh, and it is a pleasure to work with because it's had 10 years of continuous refinement and um, is better today than it was 10 years ago, which is the exact opposite that you get experience you get from most code bases. Most code bases, you say, this is 10 years old and I hate my life, right? But uh, no, it's, it's actually, I'd much rather work with the code as it is today than the code as it was five years ago or, or seven years ago. That, that's fantastic. And uh, I will have to say someone recommended your course. So I did uh, several videos in uh, test-driven JavaScript and really helped me when I was first uh, doing my JavaScript journey. Uh, oh, thank you. So, yeah, yeah. So thank you for that. And uh, I too have a big passion for evolutionary design. And I, I think one thing that I think I cannot leave, like a, whether, whatever the change is, a feature, a bug fix, um, you know, some sort of experiment without leaving it at least better than we found it. You know, it doesn't have yeah. to be perfect, right? But at least better than we found it. And because uh, I too have been on that path where you don't do that and then it gets worse and worse and worse. And then in two years, you, like you said, you hate life for being on yeah. this project. <laughs> and so I'm really passionate about, I'll, I'll get in front of the team and draw the curve. Like this is what happened to me before and we'll get there unless we do a little bit, you know, every time. The one part of the paradox that maybe you can help solve for me when explaining it, because I confuse myself as well, is I think that phrase you said, it was uh, just make the design perfect for today, right? Mm -hmm. And what I've noticed is in practice, people can interpret that different ways and they, they either can take it a slant for let's refactor a ton right now or slant for let's do no refactoring because you're prefactoring and we don't even need that today, right? Um, so like I've heard you mention design patterns and making it readable or, you know, isolating certain pieces. How do you, how do you differentiate what's needed for today and what's what's not as far as cleanliness goes? <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's a good point. I mean, my overriding my overriding guideline is exactly what you mentioned: is is it needs to be better than I left it. I said perfect for today. That's the ideal, but we're not able to make large code bases perfect, um, and we don't. 
it, it's not a good use of our time to make to make large code bases perfect. So um, I when I'm when I'm coaching teams and doing extreme programming, um, we use iterations rather than continuous flow or Kanban approach. Um, and one of the reasons that I do that to start out with is that the iteration time box is a really good uh, mechanism for understanding whether or not uh, the agile practices are working well. Because if you get to the end of the iteration time box and you aren't able to finish everything that you signed up to do in that iteration time box, then something has gone wrong somewhere and there's a learning opportunity there. Um, so in an environment where you have iteration time boxes, which are not the only way to do it, uh, and I'm not gonna say it's the way everybody has to do it, but in an environment where you have the iteration time box, you can look at the clock or the calendar and you can look at your backlog, you can look at the tasks that you've designed that you're gonna work on this week. And you can say, how far, how do these compare? Are we, if we're halfway through the week, do we have more or less than half of our tasks done for the week? And if you have more than half your tasks done for the week, that means you have slack. Uh, you have time available to do other things and still get all your work done. And this is true that day one, day two, like you can look at this every, every time you're thinking, am I going to refactor right now? You can look at the board and say, do I have enough slack to do this bigger refactoring that I've identified? Or do I not? If you do, then yeah, go ahead and spend a couple of hours uh, extracting a class or, or, um, or splitting up, you know, combining two classes or maybe moving a responsibility from one place to another. Um, and if you don't, then do a smaller refactoring and let's do a rename or something like that. Let's make the code a little bit better. But no matter what, leave the code better than you found it. Um, according to your judgment and the people, the judgment of the people you're working with. So if you're doing mobbing, of course, that's gonna be a team discussion. I think one of the challenges of mobbing is uh, having enough of those conversations to be able to have them effectively and not derailing every hour. Um, <laughs> the, uh, if you're pairing, then the nice thing about pairing is that you and your pair can have a little conversation and then another pair will look at it later and then make their own judgment about, do we wanna refactor this? Um, the, uh, but either way, you leave it a little bit better than you found it. If you don't have time to do that, then you need to sign up for less. Uh, then you do, you do keep going until it's a little bit better than you found it. And if that means that you can't do as much in an iteration, then you just choose to do less next iteration. Right on, right on. Yeah, I like that a lot. And I think at one point we were with a team, it was several mobs and we drew on the board, like, here's the minimum. I think what you got at least a little bit better, right? And then a bunch of people were passionate about way over here on the on the board, right? And so uh, I think at that point we split into two mobs. One just did the little bit and then moved on to the next thing. The other one picked up the bigger thing. And uh, <laughs> yeah, but but I, I like I like the making the distinction right between like here's the minimum. We can't we can't go lower than this or else we're we're down on that downward spiral to uh, to no fun land. Um, but uh, yeah, I like that. There, there's another big part of this that I want to be sure to mention because it's usually. In, in my experience, when I'm doing evolutionary design, it's actually not, I've finished a feature and now I'm refactoring it. Mm -hmm. It's, I have a feature I want to put in and the code doesn't work for that feature. Um, and that's what I call reflective design. Um, we're often, when people think about design, they, they do what I call predictive design. They think, what design can I imagine uh, will solve the problems that I'm going to have in the future? And I'm going to predict the future and I'm going to make a design to solve that. Uh, and that is a valid way to design. It's the way I think most people learn to design. But another way to design that's easier and I think more effective is reflective design. What is the design I have today and how effective is that for the thing that I'm doing today? And what changes can I make to the design? How can I refactor this design to make it easy to put in my new feature? So I will do a lot more refactoring to enable a feature addition than I will to do refactoring after I've added a feature because um, once I've put the feature in, presumably, you know, if I've just, if I've refactored the design to make the feature to, easy to add, I've saved myself time and I've made the code better. And so now I've sort of hit that, that line. Sometimes I'll put the feature in and be like, eh, boy, this is really, I got it to work and I, <laughs> I kind of hate myself for it. So I'm going to refactor it. But much more often it's coming into the code saying, what idiot wrote this? It, it was me. And, um, and saying, well, this just doesn't work. I've, you know, this is, I've had a couple of months to think about this and it's clear that this was actually not a great idea. I need, I should have done this instead. I'm going to refactor so I can 
to do that. And that will allow me to put this new feature in. And the best example of that I have, by the way, that 10 year old code base, I use globals for, <laughs> and that would just, just shoot me. Um, I, I justified it by saying, well, it's a read only global, yeah. which it is, but don't use globals kids. Just, yeah. just don't do it. Um, you know, uh, I think we do ourselves a great disservice by saying red, green refactor often. Mm -hmm. And I've started to, to talk about it in terms of refactor, red, green refactor. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I think that, uh, you know, especially for our newer developers, like, uh, you know, as we're onboarding, we talk a lot about red, green refactor. And then I just noticed this tendency for refactor after. And, and I realized that over the years, I've just not been putting enough emphasis on refactoring before. Um, and then I think just to kind of support what you were saying, it's like, uh, you know, if you're refactoring the patterns and you want to put in a strategy pattern, uh, you know, putting the strategy pattern in for one example of a variation is, you know, maybe that preemptive design that you don't necessarily need. But, but then there's like the Kent Beck thing of like, uh, you know, make it easy to change, then make the easy change. It's like, now we have item number two and they belong in a strategy pattern and it wasn't before, like now is the appropriate time to refactor. And so, so I think it's, it's, you know, obviously things deteriorate over time and there's natural em entropy in the code and you need to refactor proactively in that way. But um, I, I think in the ideal world, if, if you are solving the problem for today, uh, then it is, it, it is this idea that it's like, hey, the tests are green. Before we start working, what refactorings can we do to make the easy change? Um, and mm -hmm. I think both concepts are, are really good things to pay attention to. So. Um, <laughs> I think it's multiple loops. I think the red green refactor makes really a lot of sense at a tactical level. Um, when you're down in the details of like, what, what line of code do I want to write to make this work? I think it makes sense to just sort of hack in whatever you can get the test to green and then refactor. And I'll do that all the time. But the bigger picture refactoring is that we're talking about sort of the design level refactorings as opposed to just the method, individual method level refactorings. Those are the ones that I'll come into new code, especially if new code I've never, I've, I've I've seen before, but it's been a while. Um, I it won't necessarily make sense on refactor to understand. And as I do that, also refactor to clean it up, to make, to make whatever thing I need. And I think that is a larger sort of outer loop of the reflective design and, and making the code base better so I can put that feature in. And then I'll go back to the little red green refactor loop, tight loop inside that. Nice. Nice. Yeah. I, I, I've also, uh, benefited from looking at it in different layers, like, like you said there, James. And uh, uh, one benefit of doing the, um, what'd you call it, refactor, red, green refactor. And then uh, uh, James, you called the reflexive, reflexive? What did you reflective, call it? Reflective, reflect, I'm reflecting on the design of the code and improving it rather than nice. predicting the design of the code. Yeah, the nice thing is when you do it before adding the feature is the team can experience the benefits of the refactoring where when you do it afterwards, it's kind of like, oh, won't this be nice later yeah. <laughs> when we have to <laughs> extend it when it's like, oh, this was nice right now. Uh, well, and also <laughs> if you're doing it, won't this be nice later? You're again, predicting what is going to be nice later and you don't really know. Right. Uh, but if you're solving the problem you have in front of you, you it's also means a lot less speculative conversation. Oh, we should do this because it's going to be better in the future. Well, I see, you know, my crystal ball says it's going to be better if we do it this way. Well, my crystal balls. No, you can just say, this is what we've got. We're trying to make this better. And if you disagree with it, then, you know, Kempex got his 10 minutes. If you disagree for 10 minutes on design, just go do both. Yep. Split up, do both, see which one's better because seeing them concretely is so much better than speculating. Nice, nice. Right on. Well, maybe we can, uh, we have a little bit of time to maybe uh, do a sound bite on the last topic here, which is uh, testing without mocks. And I, I, uh, I do grant, um, when I did watch uh, your uh, mini videos from your uh, test driven uh, JavaScript videos, the subject did come up and it did generate questions for me after seeing the videos, but uh, um, yeah, it was, it was great. And uh, yeah, what, what, what's your, what's your take? Yeah, so um, this has been something I've been developing for a long time. I, I first got exposed to mocks as a way of testing um, testing difficult things back in 2000 on that first extreme programming project. We read the first mock paper by Steve Freeman and Nat Price um, and a third author whose name escapes me at the moment and, um, and tried it. And I didn't love it. I, I felt like it, it 
it worked, but it made the code harder to understand. And it's sort of been on a crusade ever since to find something better. And um, I think, and I've, I've been working on that and working on that. And the first iterations of trying to make it better were not shareable because they involve things like an is in test mode global variable, which, you know, that was bad. Um, but ultimately I've, I've over the years, as I've sort of refined my approach and I have got something I think is pretty darn good. Um, I've realized that this isn't really about mocks or no mocks. This is about two fundamental approaches to testing. One is interaction-based testing and the other isolated interaction-based testing and the other is sociable state-based testing. And they each have their pluses and minuses. Mm -hmm. Isolated interaction-based testing, which is the mockest approach to testing, says that we are going to test our units in a way that isolates them from the rest of our program. And we are going to validate behavior by saying that the unit under test, the system under test, is communicating with the other parts of the system correctly. And um, if you've got this certain sort of tell, don't ask object-oriented mindset, it works really well. The downsides are that you can end up in a case situation where your tests sort of are repeating exactly what's happening in your production code. And you feel like there's not a lot of there there. And the thing that bothers me more is that um, you end up with code that will pass its tests even if the behavior that it's programming in its mocks is not the behavior of the real system. Mm. Um, because of course the mocks are programmed in a way that the tests define, not the way the rest of the system defines. And that's because they're isolated tests. The alternative is sociable state-based tests. And you can do both of these in the same program. It's not you know, this way or that way, or the you know, testing gods will come down and smite you. Um, Although that would be fun. I mean, I know a couple of people who could be sm smoked by the testing gods, but um, <laughs> they're not going to spite you because they don't exist. A sociable tests say that our system under test calls the rest of our system. And thus, when the behavior of the rest of the system changes, the tests of the system under test will catch that if the system under test is affected by those changes. So that's a sociable test. Um, the rest of the code does run. Some people don't like that. I think it's fine. Uh, and it's a state-based test in that the way we define the behavior of our code is not by who it calls or who it interacts with, but rather what return values do you get back or what changes in state do you see? So that's a sociable state-based test. Hmm. Um, downside of this is that you now have to modify your production code to expose state that wouldn't otherwise be exposed. So if I write something to a log, that doesn't really change state in your program that anybody can see. It just is gone forever. Uh, and unless you want to spin up a log and run it for real, which is really slow, you've got to have something on your log. I write a method called track output that will give you ability to see what the log is writing out to the uh, external system. Some people really dislike that. So um, there's a trade-off here between isolated interaction-based tests where you've got tests that aren't necessarily real and have a little bit of a duplication with your production code, or you can have a state-based test that is very real and is also, I think, tends to be easier to read, but now it requires you to, to uh, modify your production code to support this, just like you see in other industries like chips. They have this protocol called JTAG, which is Joint Test Automation Group, I think. Um, uh, there's pins on chips that allow you to, to run tests on the chips after it's been manufactured. It's a similar idea. Anyway, this whole thing is what I call testing without mocks. Um, and you can find out more, those of you listening, you can find out more uh, by going to jamesshore.com slash S slash LNL. It's a whole series of lunch and learn videos about this idea. Um, or you can Google James Shore and testing without mocks and you'll find the white paper about it. Awesome. Awesome. This has been a, um, uh, raging would be exaggerating, but it's been a, a, a debate discussion going on uh, amongst the teams I've been on is uh, maybe not exactly the distinction you're making between the mockist and the sociable state. Is that, did I get that right? Sociable. It's also called classicist, um, classicist. But yeah, okay. but it's a state-based approach to, right. uh, to the tests. Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we've seen, uh, like you said, different uh, philosophies and different styles happening in the same code base and as people go around with their with their philosophy and try it out in different code bases and and so it's an area of uh, great learning for me so I appreciate you sharing resources on that and maybe the one question before we close because I know we're getting close to time is maybe maybe it's my misunderstanding of the so so to speak testing without mocks 
but I've seen cases of it where it basically just takes the mock out of the test code and puts it into the production code. Um, is that a misunderstanding or is that a, a different pattern of it or? Uh... <laughs> well, there's, I mean, there's, there's a lots of, lots of parts to doing a state-based testing approach. Right. And one of the, one of the ideas, and you'll see it in, in both schools of thought is, well, let's make sure our logic is separated from our infrastructure. Um, but if you do have tests of infrastructure, uh, you need a way of making that infrastructure not talk to the outside world. And a mock, of course, isolates you from the outside world. Um, but if you're doing a sociable test, if you're doing my, my style of testing without mocks, mm -hmm. you need a way of turning off that interaction. And you can either just choose to use mocks for that part of the code, mm -hmm. or you can use what I call a, a nullable infrastructure object. And this is an object that has the ability to be turned off. So if I've got a log, I want to be able to tell the log, don't talk to the outside world. And you can either do that with a method call, you know, disconnect, or you can have a factory method, which is my preference, which says create this in a null state that does not actually talk to the outside world. And some people, and a, a convenient way to implement that is with an embedded stub of the underlying code that talks to the outside world. Mm -hmm. um, which is very different than what you see from a mock, but superficially looks like a test double because it's a stub. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where you might see people saying, well, you've put the test code, you've moved the test code from the mock to the production code. Mm -hmm. But the outcome is very different because now you're still running all of your real production code all the way up to the ends of the system, which in a mock-based approach, you don't see. Uh, if you're doing mocks correctly, you're, you're mocking out the next layer down. Um, whereas in a state-based classicist approach, uh, you're not. No, that helps a lot. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I think we're approaching time here. So um, James, uh, before we close out, is there anything that you want to plug or share uh, before we close out the show? Yeah, uh, I want to want to mention my book again, of course. Uh, it's a how-to guide for teams that want to be really good at doing Agile well. Uh, it's the Art of Agile Development. You can find it on Amazon or your favorite bookseller. Um, that, And I've got a whole bunch of bonus material on my website at jamesshore.com slash s slash aoad2 for Art of Agile Development 2. Uh, and one of the things I'm doing right now is I'm doing a weekly call-in talk show uh, with, with lots of folks. Just had Martin Fowler on last week and I have Kent Beck on next week. Um, I've got some, some fantastic folks lined up for the future. So um, come check that out. Awesome. All right. And uh, to our audience, um, you know, if you're, if you're scaling your team uh, or you know somebody who's scaling their team and uh, they need maybe some input on other ways of doing things, or uh, maybe somebody's working on a, an architectural change in their system, or maybe they're struggling with testing and mocks, uh, then please share this episode with them. It, it will be helpful to both them and us. Uh, and uh, with that, we'll just say thank you very much for watching uh, or listening. Like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and uh, we'll see you all later. And thanks, James, for being on the show. Bye, My everybody. Pleasure. Thank you for having me.